Good morning. My name is Eugene Meyer. I'm president of the Federal Society nationally, and uh, I'm del delighted to welcome you all here on behalf of our Stanford chapter, which has done a wonderful job uh, setting this up. I particularly want to thank Zach Young, who's the president of the chapter, and our, and our, our other students, there have been a bunch of them who've worked, worked on this. Um, uh, and we're, we're, we're delighted to be, uh, to be hosting it, uh, to have the chapter be hosting this and delighted to help out in whatever way we can. Um, I wanted to say about 20 seconds of what, we're, what we think we're about here. Um, we believe very much in the importance of debate and discussion, that this is how people learn, it's how people get, uh, develop better policy. And we think the way, the way to do that, in part, is through reason and discussion, debate, differences of opinion, and out of that, better, pop, better ideas come from that. Uh, and that's what we hope to do here. This is an especially interesting and controversial area. The whole, all kinds of critical issues are bubbling all over the place in terms of, in, in terms of technology, in terms of all kinds of things going on is covered by this conference. Uh, law is a key part of that. And we think that type of discussion uh, will be extremely beneficial. We expect during the course of the day uh, you will hear all kinds of things, many of which you will strongly disagree with, and that is great. That is, once again, how we learn. Um, so we're, de we're, de we're delighted to be helping to host this. And without further ado, I'd like to call up our in initial panel to kick things off. Can you come up? And McDonald, our student at Stanford, will be moderating this opening panel. So thanks, and thank you. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, so start by introducing our, our first uh, conversationalists. We have Sal Churi, who is co-founder and general partner at Trust Ventures. Uh, that's a venture fund that backs uh, startups facing regulatory barriers. Their portfolio includes, among many other companies, uh, Icon, which is a developer of 3D printed homes, Visibly, uh, a provider of online vision screening, and Vari Variable, very able, uh, a platform for connecting businesses with on-demand labor. Before founding Trust Ventures, Sal was a law professor at the University of Chicago, where he founded the university's innovation clinic, and he's also practiced law at Kirkland and Ellis, Sidley Austin, and the Institute for Justice. And we have Miles Jennings, who's general counsel at A16Z Crypto, the crypto-focused arm of venture fund Andreessen Horowitz. A16Z funds startups across the sector, from digital currency platforms to trading protocols to NFT marketplaces. Before joining A16Z, Miles was a partner at Latham & Watkins, where he advised startups uh, operating in heavily regulated industries and chaired the firm's global blockchain and cryptocurrency task force. So the theme of our conversation is regulation as opportunity. And I think you know, that, that phrase to me is, is sort of counterintuitive um, initially. So I'd like to ask uh, each of you to sort of explain what that phrase means to you. And Sal, I'll, I'll start with you. How did you, how did you come to, to see that? policy risk could actually be a good thing. Uh. Yeah, so it's funny. I, I think people's opinion of this has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, so when I went out to, to launch my first fund, which was 2018, um, this, had, this sort of impetus for, for the fund came out of work that I had been doing both at the Institute for Justice uh, and, and at the law school. So had been kind of teaching, and I was like a talking head on this subject, but also actually working with startups, helping them overcome these regulatory barriers. What I very quickly realized was, once you successfully surmount a barrier, a company can grow exponentially, right? And then a step further, the companies that tend to have the largest regulatory barriers actually tend to have the largest markets. Right? The most regulated things are actually the most important things. Think of housing, think of healthcare, think of energy, right? uh, money. These are the things that, that sort of drive the economy forward. They're, they're massive, massive industries, but they're also the most regulated. And so what I sort of came to believe was that 
the most important problems in the world are gated by regulatory. If you can develop a competency and a capability for overcoming those regulatory barriers, you can not only back, you know, sort of ex ante the most valuable companies in the world, you can actually help create them by removing those regulatory barriers. We're sort of like an activist strategy, and you can sort of see the, the Institute for Justice uh, maybe, maybe impulse there, which is, you know, finding things that dramatically improve people's lives uh, and then bringing capabilities to sort of unlock those markets. It was, it was a mentality I developed uh, while working at IJ, predominantly with lower-income entrepreneurs on the south side of Chicago. So I, I sort of came to believe and, and was helped by this really strong antidote, anecdote, which was one of my fraternity brothers had been the first employee at Uber. He was the CEO before Travis stepped in. And I sort of got to watch him go through all that while I was a, a Fed Sox student at University of Chicago at the law school. Um, and I sort of realized... What happened there was not simply a great piece of technology getting into people's hands. What happened there was a lot of regulatory arbitrage, right? There, there was a great technology uh, stack built there, but maybe what was the most important is there was an ancient and broken system, right? 50 plus years old, uh, this medallion system that sort of people had been attacking for decades, right? Uh, Milton Friedman was writing articles about this in the 80s, about how terrible the taxi monopoly was. But nothing really was able to successfully move the needle on it. There was a collective action problem on how do you actually change this law? Right? How do you get rid of these bad old laws? How do you harmonize sort of the state of the law, which is inherently um, in stasis, right? Laws don't change without you changing them, versus technology, which is sort of changing every day. How do you, how do you drag the law kicking and screaming to the state of where technology is, right? But also, how do you sort of dial down the influence of large incumbents on the regulatory landscape and dial up the influence of disruptors, dial up the influence of the people who can build the things that will shape people's lives in the next 20 years, in the next 50 years, in the next 100 years. Um, so I watched Uber do that in 10 years. I watched them do what a thousand white papers could not do, what a thousand candidates could not do. And I said, man, this is, this is like a growth area. Um, and so I'm at Chicago, I'm, I'm running the innovation clinic, and I'm saying, how do I build the lawyer of the future? So I start sort of deploying my, my students on these projects. And then I very quickly, or very slowly, uh, I was pretty slow on the uptake uh, of this, I, I sort of realized, wow, every time you remove one of these regulatory barriers, the company grows exponentially. So what I should do is invest first, then remove the barrier, and then capture some of that value I'm creating. So I actually, I look at it not only as regulation is a good heuristic for where there is opportunity, right? It's, uh, it's sort of a heuristic for stasis, uh, and not all stases can be removed, right? Not, not every regulatory barrier can be surmounted. And there are some categories that I stay away from. Like, if you tell me, hey, I need to change American immigration law to hire more foreign workers, I'm going to say, great, I can't help you with that. I'm not a big enough fulcrum for it. Um, and I think maybe one that's worth mentioning here is crypto is one that we, we typically don't do. Because we just say, we're not a big enough fulcrum to, to move those issues. Those issues are, are big and multifarious. Um, but things like energy, things like healthcare, um, things, things like construction, where, you know, and I can give you, you more examples maybe as we progress. Um, I just basically came to the conclusion, there's all these obvious technologies for society that can dramatically improve people's lives, but the obvious is not the inevitable, right? And so if you can find those technologies and you can remove the regulatory barriers that gate their ability to scale, we believe that's the most asymmetric dollar that you can deploy in the economy. So we find those companies, we remove those barriers, and we kind of reap the rewards for our LP. So that's maybe a 10,000 foot mm -hmm. on how we kind of, we look at these monopolies and we see piggy banks. Uh, and if you can break them open, there's a lot of value hiding inside. Yeah, that's a great start. Um, Miles, I guess I'll, I'll ask you, would you say that, that the crypto market is, uh, is sort of something that's emerged in part because of stringent regulations on traditional financial markets? Like, were those regulations a heuristic for stasis that crypto uh, needed to disrupt? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that the, uh, you know, everything that, that Sal was just talking about very much applies uh, within the crypto space right now, and we're seeing that play out pretty much in real time. So, like, a good example of, of someone that's been able to use regulatory, um, you know, compliance as a, a, you know, as a weapon, uh, Coinbase is, is a great example of that, right? They were kind of the first ones through the gate of getting people to, you know, provide their personal information, you know, scanning their licenses, and basically, you know, all of that was so that they could comply with, you know, AML and KYC laws. And, you know, as a result of being kind of the first one through the gate, that's just paid dividends for them for, for several years now. 
and you know there that that kind of growth is is possible with a lot of other platforms that we see in the space um, except that you know people are either trying to you know you either need to get through the gates of regulatory compliance or you need to kind of remove them as, as Sal was saying so you know one other area where we're seeing a lot of that right was within decentralized finance the the key kind of development with respect to decentralized finance is that you know you're basically removing intermediaries from f like complicated financial transactions as a result of that they're you know able to be more efficient uh, and there's less of a take rate taken by intermediaries intermediaries. Um, now, one of the problems is, is you know, w with that structure is that our entire kind of financial regulatory scheme is based on the idea that there is an intermediary, and the intermediary is usually the one that is, is, is uh, regulated. And so as a result of that, you have all of these decentralized finance platforms that are out there, um, you know, providing uh, real, I mean, you know, complex and, and interesting financial solutions for people, but at the same time, um, you know, they're not able to collect KYC and AML information um, that, you know, would allow them to be compliant with, you know, the historic uh, regulatory regime that's in place. And so as a result of that, you know, we're, we're now kind of seeing, you know, the, the government kind of start to uh, move more into the, you know, DeFi world and, and start to investigate some of these companies. But so the question, you know, now is, is like, are we better suited applying this old regime, um, you know, to these new platforms, or should we try to embrace the efficiencies that they provide uh, and, and, you know, do away with, with the existing uh, regime? Yeah, t to pick up on that, um, I know Coinbase just released a proposal that basically said, uh, you know, we need a new regulatory regime. The SEC is not competent to, to, uh, to regulate decentralized, you know, platforms. So do you have a stance on that? What, what, what would you respond? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so there's a, a number of different uh, approaches that, that people are, are um, you know, putting out into the world. I think that, that the, you know, in an ideal world, we would probably end up with a new regulatory body and, and a new, um, you know, iteration of, of regulation applying to, you know, these platforms and, and to the securities analysis for, um, you know, for cryptocurrency and tokens that are issued. Uh, I, I think that that's, you know, probably not the most pragmatic or, or um, you know, direct approach to actually, you know, achieving success. I think that, that, you know, that would take a significant amount of legislation and it would take a, you know, bipartisan um, action. And so I think that, that overall, um, you know, that it's unlikely to occur at, at a pace that, is going to be necessary for the industry to be able to keep growing. I mean, the amount of, of momentum right now within the industry is, is massive. And, you know, spending the next three years litigating over whether or not, you know, a new uh, regulatory body needs to pull, you know, to be created, the jurisdictional issues that that will obviously create among the, the existing regulatory bodies is, is just, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem like the most, the fastest path to, to kind of resolving some of the issues that are out there. Um, you know, A16Z, we, we have, we've been building out a, a fairly large policy team, uh, and we, you know, introduced policies to uh, Senator Toomey, who is on the Senate Banking Committee, um, you know, who would have requested. That, that people from industry provide of legislation. And, and our proposals are very much more targeted towards specific problems that we, you know, are seeing. And so um, those include, you know, stuff on stable coins, um, stuff on DAOs. DAOs are uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, which is, is really a, a kind of new construct of how people are organizing um, and, you know, it's, it's basically like the 21st century version of, a, of the corporate stock charter. And, you know, so these, and then we, you know, a disclosure regime for decentralized entities and, and all of these things that would basically help provide consumer protection uh, and move the ball forward on, you know, providing a more clear regulatory framework for people to operate, but doesn't get into the whole investment contract and securities analysis because, um, you know, there's just, there's been so much written on that already and there's been so little movement that it's hard to imagine that, that there's a, you know, a, a quick fix for it all. Right. I think it's maybe just a, tack on to that. There's, there's like this interesting dichotomy between a company like Coinbase, which is now a colossus, yeah. right? Coinbase is a big company. Yeah. It's not a very old company, but it's a big company uh, that succeeded through sort of a regime that began with a lot of uncertainty. And now they're, they're craving that certainty because they're a colossus that needs to plow forward. Then you've got all these sort of new companies that you guys are, you know, you're, you're out there backing that are sort of really in the early stages who might benefit from, from uncertainty and chaos. That's right. And you guys have to sort of think through that dichotomy by sort of 
you know, helping the, the really nascent companies, uh, but also kind of you know, finding a way towards some, some stability and predictability for the large one. It's a, it's a really interesting position that you yeah. sit in. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. And, and the, the, you know, the power of this technology can't be understated, right? So there's a, the example of, of if you compare Uniswap versus Coinbase, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange uh, that A16Z invested in a few years ago. Um, and, and what a decentralized exchange is, is essentially it's, it's a, it, it operates on the blockchain through a series of smart contracts. Smart contracts are just um, uh, programs that, that live on a blockchain. Uh, and, you know, I think it's somewhere around 700 lines of code and it, it is, uh, you know, it's created by a team of between 15 and 25 people. Um, and they're capable of doing, you know, trading volumes that are, uh, you know, commensurate with what Coinbase is currently doing. Um, but the difference is, is that, you know, Coinbase has, has hundreds of people working for it. It's taken them a very long time to build the platform that they have. And, you know, it's not infinitely scalable. If they wanted to continue to scale for a lot of greater trading volumes, they would need to add more people. Whereas Uniswap could literally scale to infinity um, without any additional people and without any additional code being deployed. So it, the power of these technologies can't be understated, and it really, uh, you know, the efficiency that may, is made possible by them is, is just so powerful and could really change, you know, how uh, traditional financial markets work and how, uh, you know, the financial institutions within them operate. To pick up on that, um, I guess, you know, one of the things that blockchain technology is lauded for is, is that it's, in a sense, trustless because people place all their faith um, faith in the code, and, and so yeah, and, and of course, Sal, your, 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 uh, your firm is called Trust Ventures, and I, you wrote a book about, about trust and what it means in the regulatory space, so I'm wondering if we can just talk a little bit about, yeah, how, how, how does trust intersect with regulation? Is regulation an effective means of, of, um, of providing uh, consumer trust in, in various platforms and technologies? You want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll lay it out. I think I think my kind of view of that word is somewhat different. I think than probably what what you'll bring to this. Hopefully, you can bring a little bit of uh, actual discipline, technical analysis. Um, my my view of it is, uh, I wrote a book with one of my colleagues um, at the law school that examined sort of trust as a call it novel uh, spectrum for the, the the information necessary to facilitate cooperation. So to disambiguate. Uh, you trust Apple, uh, and that's why I see a bunch of laptops with a little Apple logo on it. People spend more on that uh, than they do on one that doesn't have an Apple logo on it because they trust that Apple has done something in their design process, right? Um, you know, McDonald's in its early days was a place that if you saw the Golden Arches, you know, low, corporate brand was something that said, I'm going to get the same experience every time I pull over uh, from, you know, the top of I-35 at the Canada border to the bottom of I-35 on the Mexico border, right? Um, these sorts of things are providers of trust. There's also interpersonal trust, right? There is sort of, you're born to a family and you, and you sort of natively have that trust in, in folks, uh, in, in kin. Um, and, and then sort of, I would say there was this shift that occurred uh, in, in corporate, or in uh, government trust, right? We sort of laid out these three, these three different spheres. And I think early in the American experiment, there was sort of this, uh, you know, agrarian economies with sort of town squares uh, sort of self-legislating. Then you move to this kind of uh, rights revolution. You had Upton Sinclair, you had the jungle, and you saw this great centralization where people in marble buildings in, in Washington uh, were looked to to kind of find the wisdom for all of us. And this is where you got all the alphabet agencies. Um, I think maybe to kind of frame up a little bit of... Uh, of I think what, what cryptos brought to the market and what, what some of the other companies that we're investing in have brought to the market is ways that enable the sort of cooperation that is most natural for, for consumers, for people, um, but really scaling up that town hall experience, right? So the, so the insight we had was Uber is a regulator, right? Uber in building a five-star safety system um, has actually created something that is novel and different from the medallion system and is actually sort of technocratically superior. It's just being provided by a private company. Um, and there's all these opportunities, I think crypto is an amazing one, um, to connect people in a way that is logical, in a way that gives them the information necessary for them to cooperate evermore. And the more cooperation you get, the more transactions you get, the more GDP grows, the more you know, human lives are lifted out of poverty and all these good things. Um, the more we can build these sort of new trust mechanisms that allow cooperation, I think trustless is, is not you know, totally, um, it's not a counterfactual, it's actually the same thing in many ways. Um, 
the more we can do this and shift it away from you know, just that sort of centralized perspective, I think the more opportunity we're gonna create and the more value that we're gonna create for people. So I sort of see crypto, um, different marketplaces and platforms as these really interesting ways to intermediate the, the provision and the production of trust between different people in the market um, that was just sort of otherwise not available to them, right? You look, at, you look at Uber and really it's just this cozy and shrinking of the firm. Right, uh, Coase wrote an article that, that ghosted all this out. I'll be the, the lame Chicago person who's who's sort of still beating the Coase uh, the, the Coase drum here. But he wrote this this article on the shrinking of the firm, and and effectively that's all Uber did. He he lowered the cost of making an RFP for someone to drive you from point A to point B, and that information became instantly available. Where else could we do that? Where else could we re replace a broken medallion system with something more logical, more streamlined that is just inherently better? Um, I don't look to the alphabet agencies to do that, right? If, if we said we have sort of the, the department of crypto, I don't think they're going to do that in the most logical way, right? Because I think their incentives are different. Um, and candidly, you know, I think we think a lot about the incentives of regulators uh, at the fund. We think about, you know, look, they don't, they don't get a pat on the back for allowing some great new technology to operate, but they do get angry calls if anything goes wrong. Right? And so typically, the presumption is going to be no, or wait, or later. Uh, and, and I think uh, you know, we do everything we can to think through how can we, how can we really only back things that, that add tremendous amounts of good for society. Um, and we use that as sort of an opportunity driver, I think much like IJ does, to say, we're going to sort of present this in a light that makes it most clear uh, what the societal value add is, so, that, so we can tell that story to lawmakers and regulators. And I think often it, it resonates. So, for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, right? I, I think that the, you know, I, I think that the existence of a consumer and vendor relationship where there needs to be trust, right, is is a pretty good indication that there's going to also be regulation that, that comes, you know, a part of that, right? So, you know, particularly within, you know, right now, the, one of the hot topics is like data privacy, right? Where uh, essentially, if you're providing a lot of your data to a vendor, um, then regulators want to make sure that that vendor is going to use it in a, in a proper manner and store it and keep it safe and all of these other things. So, you know, as a result of that, right, like the inherent uh, idea that there, you know, when there is an intermediary, when there's someone that you're interacting with and, and giving information to, um, the, you know, the government typically tries to step in and, and regulate that so that it, you, you know, the consumers don't ultimately, uh, are, get harmed. Um, you know, within the crypto space, uh, you know, a lot of that paradigm is is kind of done away with um, because of, of the trustless architecture of, of what's capable within the crypto space. So by trustless, um, you know, what I what I mean is essentially the the smart contracts that are deployed to a blockchain um, that provide, for instance, decentralized financial services are typically immutable, which which means that they cannot be changed. And, and that means that that code will exist in the blockchain in perpetuity, uh, you know, forever. And as a result of that, right, you know, anyone that is using those platforms that, that those smart contracts uh, underlie can look to see how they will function. And there's no kind of question as to whether or not, um, you know, someone could make them function differently or change them. And as a result, you have this trustless relationship between the code uh, and and the user of, of that code. And, and there doesn't need to be a situation where you're, you know, trusting the developer that, that developed it because they've already deployed it. You can view it yourself. There, there are third-party audit services um, that look at them. Now, obviously, that system's not perfect. There have been plenty of, of hacks or exploits um, carried out within decentralized finance. But also, you know, I mean, the technology is, is only a few years old. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that we're seeing, right, is that, you know, a lot of the traditional financial world, right, wants to apply the same regulations that are applicable to banks. You know, so let's just say keeping an amount of assets on your balance sheet if you're a bank and, and not lending out to a point where, you know, there could temp potentially be a run on the bank. Within you know decentralized finance, there are platforms that allow you to you know uh, store your your tokens, uh, borrow other tokens based on how much you've you've contributed, 
And you know, those are all based on collateralization ratios that are public and cannot be changed. Uh, you know, other than through the decentralized governance mechanism, which again means that you are able to kind of, you know, the consumer is able to assess the risk of, of contributing their tokens to that platform and, and what the potential chances are of, you know, a run and, and, and then, you know, ultimately suffering harm. So as a result of that, right, there are a lot of arguments to make that, that there is no need to, you know, apply regulation to a, uh, a protocol that, that does those things because again, like, who are you regulating? And what would the purpose of that regulation be other than, you know, regulating for regulate, re regulation's sake? Yeah, uh, I guess going back to the, the, the Coase theorem and sort of the idea of transaction costs, like, do you think that's a winning argument um, uh, when you're sort of lobbying uh, legislators to, to deregulate an industry? Would that, would that have sway over them? No. <laughs> why, why not? <laughs> um, I, I, don't think you, I don't think you come to a lawmaker and say, this is going to lower transaction costs. I think you have to couch it and phrase it in terms of, our biggest societal problems are not going to get solved unless we are able to sort of move policy forward to match the state of the technologies that already exist to solve these problems. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. This is what we do all day. Uh, you mentioned Icon. This is a company, we were the first institutional money in it. It is basically a robotic arm that can 3D print a house in 24 hours, right? So we were the first check in it. Um, we, we had to get the first ever permit in history, permits in history for 3D printed homes. Uh, we had to get them accepted by international fire and building code. We had to sort of normalize this with the different cities where they were building it. But if you think about the upside of, of a 3D printed home, it's not... It, it does actually have an effect on transaction costs. That's not how you couch the argument. You, have, you couch the argument by saying, there are all these approaches to solving affordable housing. We have a different approach, which is cut the cost of a house in half and make it buildable in one day. That's a really good way to solve affordable housing, by making it affordable, right? And so our view of it was, talk about that societal impact. So we built, so we, we took them from, you know, being the, the first institutional investor uh, to they just raised 200 million bucks from some really smart folks. It was like Bond, Norwest, a bunch of really great folks. Uh, but they're putting up 150 home communities with one printer. They are down in Mexico building entire communities uh, of homes for folks who've never had a home before. The first person ever to move into a 3D printed home was a formerly uh, chronically homeless man in Austin, Texas. There are some really amazing stories that come out of this. There's also a massive addressable market right, in the hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars for solving that problem. So we see it as the spoils of solving the world's greatest problems are tremendous. That's why we do this. We are a returns-focused venture capital fund. But that's also a really good heuristic for solving grand human challenges, right? Another quick example, you know, there is no always-on source of affordable clean energy, right? Solar's awesome when the sun shines, wind is great when the wind is blowing, uh, batteries are getting better, but not in any sort of exponential kind of way. Uh, and we looked at nuclear and we said, this was a solved problem 60 years ago. They solved this problem a really long time ago, but that technology has just been sitting in political stasis. So everyone should look this up. There, there was a reactor called Ex Experimental Breeder Reactor 2. Uh, to nerd out for a moment. Argon Labs ran this reactor for 30 years between the 60s and the 80s. It put out three cents zero emission electricity and it's always on, which means you can power industrials with it, which is a very, very big thing, right? Um, very hard to power a factory in India or China with solar, right? Which is why it's not happening. And unless you make it cheaper, it won't happen. Um, and so this thing put out three cent zero emission electricity, which basically is as cheap as it gets, right? You beat just about everything but nat gas in the Permian Basin. But it's been sitting on the shelf because there are two companies that have effectively brought every reactor to market in the United States forever, which is GE and Westinghouse. And they're not, they sort of said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But of course it's broke, right? We're actually going in the wrong direction. Diablo Canyon's about to be taken offline. Nuclear is just, it's, it's the most energy dense source of, of, uh, of power on planet Earth. And it's just been sitting in stasis. So we backed a company called Oklo and we helped them get the first ever in history nuclear regulatory commission acceptance for a gen four modular nuclear reactor. They're these tiny reactors. Everyone should check these guys out. They're here in the Bay Area, Oklo, OKLO. They basically are making micro reactors that are almost like generators. You can throw them on the back of an 18 wheeler. You factory manufacture them uh, and you can sort of roll them, off, roll them off an assembly line, put them on an 18 wheeler, truck them up to rural Alaska where they can power a fishing village of 100 homes. You can power a data center. 
Uh, you can power a Bitcoin mining operation. You can do all sorts of really interesting things with this. Uh, but but we, we were able to get them past that critical inflection point and helping to change that that sort of uh, regulatory barrier, it doesn't just happen by saying we're gonna lower transaction costs. You have to show the impact, which in this case is affordable housing or zero emission electricity that can actually address uh, the need by industrials for these things. And the results are tremendous, right? It's, it's coming in, first money in two years ago to raising $200 million uh, in the case of ICOM. With Oaklo, it is, again, we were sort of in one of those really institutional, early institutional rounds uh, two years ago, and they've got, you know, billions of dollars in MOUs. So when you can change those things, the spoils are great, but in order to change them, I don't think you talk just about the financial uh, consequences. You have to show its effect on people. And I think there's a lot of lawmakers that are excited about being part of one of those grand societal solutions. So I don't think Coase was wrong about this. I just think we have to shift from just talking about uh, these things in sort of cold and calculated terms and actually showing its impact on people because the impacts are tremendous. Miles, um, what what story would you tell about the impact that crypto could have? Yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, it's it's still um, it's still early days, and you know, there are examples of you know, for instance, during the Afghanistan pullout, um, you know, one of our uh, one of the people at A16Z was was a helicopter pilot there, and and he was working with some friends to try and get their translator out. Uh, their translator didn't have any money, and so they used actually Bitcoin to you know transfer money to him so that he could then use it to um, you know get out. Out of the country, um, which is you know a very small like use case, and obviously is not something that's going to come up very often. But it is one example of, of just you know payments technology, you know helping people. Um, but in, in the grander scheme thing of things, right there are um, you know what this technology affords. There's a there's a pretty good quote by the guy that invented um, uh, Ethereum, uh, Vitalik Buterin. And, and basically what he said, right, is that, you know, if you look at what Web 2.0 is, um, you know, these are the Facebooks, Twitters, Ubers of the world. What they did is, is basically, you know, concentrate an extreme amount of power uh, at a centralized entity um, at the expense of the periphery, right? So all of your gig economy workers and all of these people. And what, you know, what Web 3 is, which is, is the, you know, basically the term that we're using for a blockchain-based um, internet, is that you know, you'll be able to decentralize that power and, and distribute it back out to the periphery where the value is actually being created. Um, one example of that is uh, within the music industry. So uh, for those of you who aren't playing video games all the time, right, there is, uh, video games have completely changed since when I was a, a child to the sense where you no longer pay for video games anymore. You basically play them and the video game companies are making more money than ever um, by selling things like skins, so uniforms or, or characters or weapons uh, to, to kids that are playing these games. And, you know, as a result of that, you've created this, you know, developer economy where, like, people can create things, sell them in-game, and, and, and actually, you know, make money. Um, but then you see things like Apple and, and Epic's dispute where Apple was taking a 30% take rate on, you know, the content that, that Epic was developing. And so, you know, what we're going to see, right, is right now there's a very, like, strong movement within the gaming space um, to create these, uh, you know, blockchain-based games where, you know, the players will actually be owners within the economy. And as a result of that, right, they'll be able to, um, you know, they'll be able to, whenever they're, like, whatever action they're engaged in, like, they can actually earn money. They can acquire NFTs in the game, which are, are basically uh, non-fungible tokens, which, let's just say, you know, a sword or a character um, that are associated with, you know, on-chain ownership of that actual item. And so as a result of that, right, you're going to see basically economies um, created out of, out of these games, and we're already seeing it in the Philippines. There's a game uh, company that we recently invested in called Sky Mavis, which makes a game called Axie Infinity. And Axie Infinity is responsible for a, just uh, thousands of people within the Philippines um, literally creating jobs for them in-game where they basically play these games, earn characters, sell them, and, and they're making more money than what uh, the minimum wage is in the Philippines for this activity. So literally, it's, it's pulling people out of poverty um, by playing a video game. So the idea that you know, in, in creating these economies for people to operate in um, will really you know, basically democratize and, and lead to open markets around the world um, where you know, people will be able to, to earn income. Uh, another good example of this is, is just within the, uh, the music industry, right? So I think that the, there are 15,000 people that make uh, over $50,000 a year on Spotify. 
It's not a lot of people. And at the end of the day, you know, why is that happening? Well, there's so many take rates between, you know, the, the creator and the uh, fan. Right. And, and so we've, you know, some of our GPs have written about how, you know, artists would be better with a, a thousand true fans. And if you look at the music industry versus the video game industry, the video game industry has iterated a ton. Right. As I said earlier, they're no longer selling games, basically. But in the music industry, we have the exact same formula that's been used for the, the last, you know, 60, 100 years. You now have streaming, but people are still paying to listen to music. And so the idea with a lot of platforms that are now kind of being created is that you can basically get rid of those, those intermediaries, directly you know, put the fans in touch with the musicians. You, you, know, you can acquire NFTs for being one of the first 100 followers of a musician. You can get a token that shows that you went to a concert. And, and all of these things that, that you know, Gen Z particularly is really focused on their you know, digital identity. And all of these things will allow them to make themselves unique in a digital space by owning these uniquely digital goods. And as a result of that, you know, the, the, the idea is that you know, artists will be able to interact with their fans directly and ultimately make a lot more money um, you know, as a result. And so you know, again, that's just one area where um, you know, that opportunity is there, but we're just really still quite early. If I could just add one, one story that for me made me an early adopter of crypto, an early adopter of Bitcoin in particular. Um, if you come from a Jewish family, portability of money actually has like real, like there's a real, there's a real kind of texture to what that means. So um, my, my maternal grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. My father was a refugee from Iraq. Both sides got dispossessed of everything. And that was because you couldn't carry your money with you, whatever you had. Uh, and you were chased out of some place at gunpoint uh, if you were lucky enough to get out. Um, Bitcoin to me just made intuitive sense as a way to say, not every, like, things are not permanent. Physical things are, are ephemeral. And if you had something that, that could move more easily, like I saw just very, very tangibly the benefit of that, that portability. Um, so I think there are all these kind of human stories, so many dimensions, yeah. right? I don't, you know, I don't think in terms of, of being a, a maker, a, a music, um, you know, a music creator, right? There's so many human stories around these technologies that, that sort of are obscured by ARR numbers or valuations or the things you read in the Wall Street Journal that I think are just so important for, for us to learn how to tell because there are people in society that are benefiting in this just like really visceral way, uh, but you know, that, just, that doesn't come up in the TechCrunch article. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it, you know, right now there are NFT artists who are, you know, I mean, they're basically creating digital art, selling it online. Some of them, you know, will go to zero and will, will ultimately not make it. But like as a result of all of this, you find that there are just tons of people that are able to, you know, take what was their artistic career and, and turn it into something that is actually very valuable to them and, and are, they're able to sustain themselves over. Another element of, of the, you know, the kind of what, what works in speaking to, you know, legislative bodies. And, and regulators is just looking at, at how the U.S. is doing on a competitive basis around the world, right? The uh, Over the last 20 years, uh, the number of foreign branches of U.S. banks has declined precipitously, um, and, you know, what is taking its place are, are Chinese banks. And as a result of that, right, U.S. influence around the world is, is waning in, within the financial sectors. Um, you know, the reason that those foreign bank uh, branches have been closed is because the cost of regulatory compliance in a lot of jurisdictions is too high. And so one of the things that, you know, DeFi really provides an opportunity for is for the U.S. to establish itself in these jurisdictions. And, and you'll see that basically in how the stablecoin legislation plays out, um, which is, is currently kind of being discussed in, in Congress and at the White House. And so... You know, right now, stable coins within crypto are almost all denominated in U.S. dollars. And as a result of that, the U.S. dollar is becoming the primary settable asset in, in crypto. And like that is ultimately a good thing if you want the U.S. dollar to be prevalent around the world. And, you know, kind of pulling those U.S. stable coins out of, of the industry um, would lead to significant harm in that respect. And so, you know, that's one of the things that e e there's just so many elements and so many facets to all of this. Um, but, you know, between helping people, you know, in the United States or around the world or to just defending U.S. interests around the world, um, you know, there are potential solutions offered by crypto. So yeah, we, we've talked a lot about you know arguments that one might make to legislators. Um, what about the problem that arises sort of because voters 
who elect those legislators may not really be aware of regulatory schemes, um, and, and it certainly doesn't really come up as like a, a hot button campaign issue. Uh, so d does that present a problem? I mean, should we should we be um, you know sort of yeah? What, what should we do about that? I mean, the the within the crypto industry, and you can speak more broadly, but the you know I think that there was a, a pretty significant awakening um, when the infrastructure bill was was moving through Congress earlier in uh, August, and and what you know we saw there basically was everyone waking up to the idea that that you know, the way that the infrastructure bill was worded um, would create potential reporting obligations for users within the space that aren't possible to comply with, um, given that, that, you know, on-chain activity typically you don't have an identification mechanism of the individual. The reason for that is that, you know, all of your on-chain records are basically on-chain, so they can be seen by anyone. If you were personally identified as owning a wallet that engaged in all that activity, someone would be able to see every single thing that you've ever done on-chain. And the other risk of that is that they would also know how much money you have. And because a lot of people self-custody within the space, um, the, there are actual real security risks to that information being leaked. So it's even more significant than your, your normal data privacy breach, which, which obviously happens quite a bit. Um, so, you know, as a result of that, the, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill was really an, a, a wake-up call to everyone in that if, if the industry did not get, you know, uh, uh, serious about uh, trying to engage with Washington, that we were going to end up with legislation that just was impossible to comply with. And, you know, un unfortunately, it's unclear what is going to happen with the infrastructure bill, but if it does go through, you know, for instance, one of the outcomes of it would be that an artist selling an NFT on OpenSea, which is the, the biggest NFT marketplace, an artist engaged in, in, in NFT sales that are over $10,000, right, would be, it would be subject to felonies for selling those NFTs because it, that artist will not be able to report who the person is that bought from them. It's just a crazy outcome of, of, of the legislative process that, you know, I mean, you have these artists who are making more money than they've ever been able to make, and now we're going to subject them to be potentially felonious. Like, it just is, is, a, is an absurd outcome. So, so Miles gets to work on a grand societal challenge made into a grand regulatory challenge. But often it's the case that the grand societal challenge is mated to a number of more garden variety regulatory challenges. So maybe I'll kind of give a counterfactual here. Uber is an easy one. Everyone knew cabs were terrible. Like everybody who got into or out of a cab between 1950 and you know, 2013 said that was awful. And then they further said, there's really nothing I can do about this because I'm not going to vote for the mayor based on my experience in this cab. Right? That's what we call a collective action problem. And so Uber found this really efficient method within their technology of helping to solve that problem, of, of sort of capturing that groundswell of, of voter demand, the sort of the citizen slash customer in this case. Right? Um, that's one, one method of engagement. There's, all, there's also, I'll give one example from our portfolio, the, the company you mentioned visibly. It's an online eye exam you can take in 15 minutes from home without having to go to lens crafters and pay 130 bucks and take a half a day off of work. Um, this is a big problem. Two and a half billion people worldwide need an eye exam and cannot afford to get one, right? Uh, even here in the US, 24% of US co uh, counties don't even have an optometrist in them, which means you're driving a county or two over to get your eyes checked, which means, you know, that's not exactly what you want people driving long distances to do, right? Um, and so, big problem, obvious technological solution, right? Quicker, cheaper, better, increasing the cost of healthcare, uh, or decreasing the cost of healthcare, increasing access. Um, everybody wins, except the person sitting at LensCrafters who really wants to charge you 130 bucks for an eye exam, right? So they want to keep it expensive, right? They're they're sort of uh, they live behind that that regulatory barrier, and so. The American Optometric Association came out trying to ban this technology in a bunch of different states. So we spent the last year uh, legalizing the online eye exam, which is a silly thing to have to legalize, right? For 70 million Americans, we did that successfully. But often the way you do that is by capturing all of that consumer sentiment, all that patient demand that previously was just hidden, right? And so if people knew there was a better way to do this, 
they would inarguably want to do it. And that's what I look for is like societal no-brainers, not partisan stuff, but stuff where like 98% of the world agrees with it, everyone except the American Optometric Association. And we can use that to build coalitions of people who never would have engaged on this, but when given the opportunity, when given the microphone, will engage on it. And so what does that do? You take an issue like this that 10 years ago before we existed, you know what happens. You know how that story plays out. You're a startup, you show up in this, this given state and you say, I'd like, to, I'd like to help all the residents of your state. And the lawmaker says, well, the Optometry Association funds the Little League team and they show up every year and you guys are just asking me for something right now. And on the other hand, we can bring all these groups from industry, like Walmart, right, to, to inner city health advocates, to rural health advocates, the people who are actually affected by this. And when you can build that coalition, you're really just shining a spotlight on some bad thing that has persisted for a really long time, and you're engaging consumers in improving the quality of their healthcare, in lowering the costs of their healthcare. That's possible. We've done it successfully across the different states, at the federal level, at the local level, and I think it's, it's a tool in the toolkit for companies that actually want to improve the world to get those folks who experience the downsides and who could experience the upsides of doing it better and really engage them in the process. So I think that we're in the beginning of a groundswell of consumers kind of weighing in on things in a way they've never had an opportunity to do before because that political process largely took place behind drawn curtains in steakhouses between lobbyists and lawmakers. I think a lot of that too. You're, you're, you know, a lot of that is made possible by uh, social media, right? And and it's one way, a uh, very effective way, to get people to, you know, focus on an issue and, and then voice, um, you know, their feelings on it. Obviously, it's also been used for negative negative things, but but um, you know, there is a lot of power in that. I, I would be interested in, in your perspective on on kind of how you try and keep those things bipartisan. Um, you know, one of the things that we're struggling with in the crypto industry right now is that some, several of the issues are starting to become partisan, and it's the last thing that we want because there there are things on both sides of the aisle that people want that that crypto solves, um, but it, it's still you know it's it's almost as though if if one side moves first, uh, then the other side you know reflexively uh, is is kind of going to be counter to it. That's a great insight. I, so I have the luxury of picking my battles. And it's actually part and parcel of my thesis and my company selection. Yeah. So when I say you've got to fight a grand regulatory fight, you're sort of, you're stuck with it, right? But the spoils are enormous and you guys do very well. But I think the way I look at it is to say, there are all kinds of societally valuable things that are hyper-partisan that I'm just not gonna touch, right? I, I pass on lots of things that are probably really big ideas because I don't wanna have to fight that fight. I, I get to say, who doesn't believe in cheaper, better eye exams? <laughs> yeah. Just the American Optometric Association. This is, this is in many ways something I learned at IJ, which is pick, picking the right bad guy is as important as picking the right good guy. Being very clear on what you're for and what you're against and stacking the deck in your favor by saying, here's some low hanging fruit for society. Here are some things everybody wishes to see yeah. change. And I don't, I don't sort of delude myself that z zero people have ever had a political reaction to anything we back. Certainly nuclear has had a political valence in, in, in sort of different ways. But I think in many ways, like we want to be part of the force that says, this is a nonpartisan thing. This accomplishes everyone's goal. And if we don't believe that story going in, we just won't invest. So I do have a cheat code in that like I get to kind of always be running downhill right. by selecting companies about whom this is true. But I also do have, I see it as an advantage in that that's a heuristic that's gonna produce the biggest companies in the economy, or I believe that anyway. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, to, go, to go back to the American Op Optometric Association, in your, in your uh, sort of dealings, like do you ever interact directly with the incumbent and sort of and, and try and lobby them to uh, stop lobbying the regulators? Is that not part of your playbook? Throw down your weapons. Uh, no, I, I, we 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 certainly we have kind of uh, dealt with with folks who wish to see their turf protected, and you know it, it's actually a fairly craven game. It makes you it makes you a bit um, pessimistic about politics when when you talk to these folks because most of them are not they don't try to make a human argument to you about why the online eye exam should be more expensive and harder to get. Right? There are all these people who can't take a day off of work, and so they literally can't see. Right? They can't afford the time off of work. They can't afford the, the $130 for an eye exam. These people literally can't see because it's too expensive. It's too hard to get. And when you tell this to someone, you've got a human being on the other side. That lobbyist is a hired gun. 
they're not going to try to tell you, hey, it really is better that it's more expensive. I think when you get them alone, they're just like, I'm here to do a job. Um, I, I think that, that sort of is dispiriting. But I think it's encouraging to see when you do draw these people out, when, when you draw these issues into the public eye, right? When you make it expensive for those lawmakers to just sort of do these things behind drawn curtains, I think sunlight's the best disinfectant. And when you, when you put these issues in front of people, we have found in our experience that they turn out a lot better than they have turned out over the, you know, the pre preceding decades. So, yes. And, and some of them, I think, truly believe, like, it's just not safe, right? Um, and I think that's why, so again, I think we're very careful about we don't want to invest in things unless we believe they are truly safe and, and run by people who care deeply about safety. Because we're not saying throw all regulation out. Yeah. We're not saying deregulate nuclear. What we're saying is let's, let's make sure we have something that is safe and effective and does take account of, uh, of, of inherent dangers, but also does it in a way that allows society to benefit from things that can dramatically change uh, what's available to us, to dramatically lower the cost of energy, lower the cost of healthcare, increase access to housing, things like that. And I think that, the, I mean, as you were saying, right, I think the, the existence of incumbents, there's always like gonna be that friction. And as a result of that, right, the, the need for those compelling, you know, human stories is, is just so much more, you know, you, you need those use cases to basically shine through. And, and those are impossible to then push against if you're the incumbent, right, because it's just so clear. This is such a good point. Sorry to mm -hmm, jump please. jump in here. I think if you if you put yourself in the in the in the shoes of a regulator to run a cost benefit analysis of like take Uber, easy example. If I if I'm Travis and I walk into your office and I say, "We're going to make this great new technology that allows you to get into some stranger's car and they're going to take you from point A to point B. It's going to be great." Like what is your likely response to that? You're going to see super concrete downsides and maybe some like vague upsides. But once consumers have already done this, once you've taken an Uber, right. you see very concrete upsides and sort of you know, intangible downsides. And I'm not saying that nothing bad ever happened. I'm saying that we're getting these cost benefit analyses wrong because we don't know how to qual quant quantify the upsides and we don't know how to tell those stories. And so I think there's reason for optimism on this. I think we're getting a lot better at it. Uh, but, but you do have to put yourself in, in the, the shoes of a rational lawmaker who just wants to protect people. Right. And, and you've got to show them the upsides. We, I think it's on, on the tech industry, it's incumbent on us to show the, the positive societal impacts alongside the negative. Yeah, there's risk in, in moving away from the status quo, right? And, and you have to show that, that that risk is far outweighed by the benefit. Yep. At the risk of sort of uh, wrapping up on, on maybe a downer, how do you think the pandemic has, has changed people's cost-benefit calculus? I mean, I, I could see it sort of going in maybe two different directions uh, with respect to emerging technologies and regulation. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, right? I think that the world has, has obviously significantly changed over the course of the last 18 months and, and that a lot of technology has been accelerated and the need for it has been accelerated. I mean, within the crypto space, right, I, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing so much activity is that, you know, people are spending a lot more time online. And as a result of that, you know, I mean, one, one example of, of kind of use of NFTs, right, is that a lot of the, the people that we work with, a lot of people in the space, will use an NFT, some digital art, as their background on their Zoom, right? And so right then, right, you, you're basically just kind of establishing this, you know, unique persona online. Um, and as a result of that, I think that, that, you know, the pandemic has really just kind of highlighted um, the need and for this technology and, and, and really have driven a lot of people towards it. So I think, you know, overall, I think it's just rapidly accelerated the cycle that we're moving towards. I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. I yeah. agree. Um, there's, we've certainly paid a, a great human cost for it. But I think on the technology side, I, I think maybe what gets me most excited coming out of the pandemic is healthcare. So one that's just really, really hard is FDA. FDA is slow and there are, there are huge costs to that. And on one hand, I'm optimistic because we got a vaccine to market in a year. I'm, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd still like to see it go faster. That vaccine was made in a few weeks. <laughs> um, and so I think there's, there's, still, there's still improvements to be made there. But I think we can learn a lot of positive lessons from that, maybe from some of the, the sort of top-down approaches. I think from the bottoms-up approach, we saw all these things that have been logical for people, the most obvious of which being telehealth, that really just got a moment in the spotlight. And I think some of those shifts, like you're talking about, 
they're not going to go away once people have had a taste of them. For things where it's really just not necessary to go into a doctor's office, I don't think people are going to do it anymore. There's no reason to kind of go back and sort of uh, sus suspend, uh, suspend disbelief and, and sort of pretend that we can't still do this. So I think there's probably a lot of normalization for things that is, that's going to be really good for consumers that came out of this. Um, and I think it shifted, it shifted living digitally for a year uh, plus has shifted a lot of uh, digital adoption that could have taken a decade or two. Well, that really speaks to the, the prior point too, right? Is that is that it's really hard to see the risks and or the benefits if you haven't actually lived in that world. And so as a result of the last 18 months, we've all been living in this digital world. And so we now see the benefits of various things, right? Zoom wasn't really being used that much before uh, the pandemic, even though it offered the exact same service that it offers now. But now people are like, well, yeah, I'd rather see this person or I'd rather not travel to Austin to have a face-to-face -face meeting when I can just be online. And, and now, you know, I mean, I had just left private practice. My client base went from being mostly focused in the Bay Area to being all around the world. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it really kind of just created all of these um, possibilities that, yeah, weren't obviously uh, apparent at the outset. It, the law itself is sort of a gravitational pull towards path dependency, yeah. right? Because the law is inherently static. New laws get made because some crisis happened. And lawmakers are forever playing whack-a-mole with crises. They're saying, let's not do that again, Glass-Steagall. New thing happens. Let's not do that again, Dodd-Frank, yeah. right? And, and you, see, um, you see that development most responsive to exogenous shocks, like a pandemic, like a, like a crisis. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a really powerful thing when you can sort of take advantage of some of those shifts forward and not, and not simply say, okay, we're, we're gonna like snap back to what the law looked like. We're gonna use this as an opportunity to shake ourselves and say, well, we haven't allowed space for change. And sometimes we have to be shaken out of complacency. And sometimes it takes a pandemic or something like that to do that. Uh, but when you have done that, I do think uh, you, you open a space for a national conversation around how we can do things better. And you shake, uh, you shake away some of that, that sort of uh, fealty to path dependency that I think can really open up avenues for change. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I hope everyone's uh, shaken up a little bit and ready to take on the rest of the day. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.